Hello everybody and happy summer. We're in the midst of it. It's about 91 degrees right now sitting outside. It feels kind of good and there's a nice breeze. I got my dog Noah back there. But listen, I wanted to talk about this alarming topic. What is going on with men and women who are young who have been diagnosed with non-smoker lung cancer? Another name for it is non-small cell lung cancer. So what is going on? You're seeing it everywhere. And I want to show you a couple things here. I watch a YouTube channel called The Patient Story and have regularly for a long time now. And you're seeing more and more people talk about their lung cancer journey, how they got diagnosed, how these athletes, young women, new mothers, mothers who are pregnant, have been developing lung cancer. Why is this happening? There's an increase in lung cancer diagnoses in young people, but also colon cancer as well, and other types of cancers. But today we're just gonna focus on what's going on with the diagnoses of lung cancer. So as always, I will post below in uh, the description uh, and also put some pop-ups here of some information. You can read journals, you can read other articles, and I also have a couple YouTube links that I want to share as well. One of them from Dr. Atia. Are you familiar with him? He's also written a book. I follow him. Fantastic information all the time about health and wellness and longevity. And he talks about um, if you're able to pay the money, if your insurance doesn't cover to get a low radiation lung MRI. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States today among men and women. Non-small cell lung cancer is the name for lung cancer when you are a never smoker or someone who has not smoked. So therefore you have a different version of lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer would be the version for those who have been smokers and it's affiliated with their smoking. So today we're just going to talk about the non-small cell lung cancer that's on the rise for those people who have been diagnosed out there who have never smoked a day in their life. They're not vapors, they're not smokers, and most of them, if you listen to their story, they are extremely healthy, vibrant people in the prime of their lives. So what's going on? people and non-smokers who get lung cancer often have a mutation. It's a gene called epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, which can be treated with a targeted therapy in the form of an oral pill. We'll get to treatments in just a minute, but it's often related to that gene that has been identified. Two to one more women than men are being di diagnosed with this type of non-smoker lung cancer and why more women than men. So here's the theory on that at the moment. Just pop in a couple other really important statistics. Over the past four decades, lung cancer diagnosis among women has surged 84% approximately, while they dropped by 36% in men. Age group concerns. In high income countries, women ages, ages 35 to 54 now face equal or higher lung cancer rates compared to men. A dramatic shift given history of the gender gaps. About 24% of women lung cancer cases occur in the never smoking population of young women compared to less than 15% overall. So back to why. Why is this going on? So I mentioned about the genetic mutation. We have the factors of more women than men, basically just due to the gender biology and hormones, never smokers and environmental factors. They've looked at that. Among the never smokers, women are two times more likely than men to develop lung cancer, contributing to 
secondhand smoke, radon, asbestos, and cooking fumes. There's a lot going on with this topic of women who are cooking, who generally in the United States, it's more often women cooking than men. So they're looking at that, what they're seeing as the connection attributed to more cooking fumes, radon again. Air pollution is still up there with a contributing factor for women getting lung cancer twice as much as men. Any age can get lung cancer. The very young can get it. They're seeing that now, but they're seeing this age group of under 50 that has just been exploding with story after story of diagnoses of lung cancer. Okay, I want to go over some symptoms. So story after story that I have listened to as I listen to these patients describe beginning to current of what is going on with them. How did it start? What kind of symptoms did they see? And most of them do talk about some of the same things. They most, but not all, talk about a cough, even if it's a small cough, it's a big cough, it's a persistent cough, it's a cough they've never had before that just is lingering and won't go away. A lot of them talk about pain, pain taking a deep breath, sharp burning pain in their lungs. Often people talk about pain here, uh, in their ribs, in their back, in their shoulders. And some people, you know, everybody describes pain differently, but some people have referred to it as, well, I've heard a man describe his pain as cramps. It's a cramp stabbing pain, burning pain, cramping pain. But pain is a symptom of something that might be going on. Other symptoms that most of them talk about has to do with fatigue, where they are healthy, active people, but now they can't keep up. They can't run the way they used to run or work out the way they once did. They attribute their fatigue to uh, having children, being working full time, being active in sports. So it's easy to kind of put that off or just a throat clearing kind of low grade cough as something unrelated to lung cancer. You're not thinking that it's lung cancer. So we've got fatigue, cough, and pain. How about night sweats? A lot of people get night sweats with lots of different kinds of cancers. That is always an issue that still goes on for people are these unrelenting, really soaking night sweats. Weight loss is another symptom. One person described she felt that something was here in her in her throat. And that just had to do with the tumor expanding. But that is really where she uh, focused on feeling that symptom. Did I mention shortness of breath? Can't remember if I mentioned that, but that's a big one as well. Where you used to be able to run up the stairs, you've got some shortness of breath going on along with perhaps some of these other symptoms. So getting to your primary care provider in a timely manner, as I've said so many times in other videos, that prompt treatment always tends to bring on a more favorable outcome than delayed treatment. Prompt, prompt treatment to see your primary care provider. If you feel like you're getting blown off, go and see somebody else. Go to urgent care, go to the ER, go to who you feel you can trust and discuss your concerning symptoms with. What are some of the things that provider might do to come to a conclusion of a diagnosis of possibly lung cancer? A thorough history and physical, some labs, labs that maybe you're looking at a mutation so that perhaps down the road you can have targeted therapy. They're going to need some very specific labs, PET scan, MRI, chest CT, test x-ray, bronchoscopy, and biopsy. For those with the EGFR mutation, they have offered targeted therapy, which seems to have excellent results. Um, there's also chemotherapy, radiation, a combination of different types of medications. And remember that a lot of these medications nowadays are in oral pill form. There are so many advances going on right now, just constantly in the treatment of cancer, especially in this type of cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. Just so I get it uh, specifically correct, I want to read to you exactly what, um, in a nutshell, when you read some of these articles, what is the theory on, what's the conclusion here about the factors existing for the increase in this non-small cell lung cancer on women? Men too, but more so in young women. Modern environmental exposures. We talked about radon and cooking exposures. Improved diagnostic tools. Actually, I should rephrase this. It's not just why, but how it's also being diagnosed. Improved diagnostic tools, shifts in population demographics, and possibly emerging or cumulative interactions between genetics and the environment. I talked briefly about Dr. Atia and how he has talked about the low dose CT of the chest, looking at the lungs for people to track this, I think it was 
every year or every two years. I think it was every year. And I believe it's approximately $200 to $250. It is covered by insurance if you are a smoker, if you have risk factors that agree with what the insurance companies are saying, so therefore they will pay. Those of us who aren't smokers then have to pay. It's interesting, isn't it? It just should be for everybody because early detection and following somebody each year so that you can see those subtle changes is what's really going to save a life. The low dose CT screening apparently reduces mortality by 14 to 20% in the high risk group. So that's a very effective tool. It's what we have for now. What else can we do? The usual for a healthy lifestyle, which always comes falls back onto eat healthy, don't be around secondhand smoke, exercise every day, and of course don't smoke, drink in moderation, don't vape, don't smoke pot, it all kind of goes together. <laughs> Putting all of the chemicals into your lungs does not improve over time and it can increase your chances of developing other problems down the road. For those of you who are new, welcome here. I appreciate each one of you. Most of my YouTube videos are topics about health. It's about myths and facts about health, doing a little deep dive into some very important topics, how we can all be as healthy as possible as things like this come our way. We're all in this together. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you at the next video. And as always, if you could do this, it's free. And of course, it always helps the algorithm. Have a good evening.